Welcome back. Today, we are continuing with the Ladies' Home Journal Book of Interior Decoration. This was published in 1954, so we have a chance to look at mid-century traditional designs as well as the beginnings of mid-century modern. So, when we come back... The section we're looking at to begin with today is called floor planning. And they actually have here, let me backtrack a little, a section with a grid so you could lay out your room and then all of these templates for furniture so that you can copy or cut out the furniture templates and lay them around your room. Probably very, very handy. Oh, look. We've got everything here. We've even got pianos. What we're looking at in this room is a very traditional room design. Um, I'm going to guess this is probably about a 12 by 15 room. And frankly, if you eliminate the weird faux window with the curtains and the mirror uh, behind the sofa, this is the sort of room layout you would see today almost anywhere. Uh, we've got a sofa, two occasional chairs, a coffee table, a couple of end tables, lamps. And although this lamp is cut off, it does look like the lamps are not a pair. And again, I like that. But this is a very typical uh, mid-century traditional arrangement of furniture. And that basic arrangement has stayed with us low these many years. Well, now we've moved over to window treatments. And this, in particular, is sort of a very standard, very traditional bedroom with what I would consider very traditional window treatments. You would certainly see this in traditionally decorated houses today with uh, the valance that's a swag and jabot valance and the curtains and again we've got a uh, like a fabric cornice up here uh, gathered up into swags, the draperies. By the way you still see rooms decorated just like this today. You could literally walk into a room like this tomorrow afternoon. Again, we've got a very traditional room layout here. This one, I don't know. It's a little sort of a nouveau Versailles for my taste. But the thing I like about this is this wonderful asymmetrical balance and the sheer curtains underneath it. That design is very old. You will see things like that in Monticello and other Revolutionary War era historic homes. It was, let me see if I can get and get you closer to see it, very 18th, early 19th century design that has obviously withstood the test of time. This it took me a long time playing with this to figure out what the devil this was, and it is a stairwell. Uh, this is our railing, and they have sections of something or other attached to the railing. I don't know. Very weird. But, of course, we're supposed to be looking at the curtains. And as you can see, the draperies are very traditional, but exactly the sort of thing you would see today in more elegant homes. This one, with our covered cornice and the draperies, yeah, I see that sort of thing all the time. I see a lot more of this, however. Just... Uh, this, these are the drapery panels 
on a rod secured by rings and then a sheer under curtain. Now the sheer under curtain is pinch pleated. You don't see a lot of pinch pleating anymore. And I'm going to find you something that will explain that. So we'll take a look at that in a second. Well, what we have here is an illustration of traditional draperies. That is the sort of thing you would see anywhere from maybe 1750 right up till today in more elegant homes. Uh, we have the swag piece, uh, and sometimes they call these festoons, and then the curtains, and they're tied back, I'm sorry, the draperies, and then they're tied back in the curtain underneath. So, let's take a look over here at some others. Again, this is just uh, a swag on the top, sort of framing the window with shears underneath. These do not go to the floor. They go to the end of the window. Uh, for some applications, you can actually have very formal curtains that don't go to the floor. By the way, that was one of the things Thomas Jefferson did in his curtain designs, and uh, they still survive, by the way, so we know what Jefferson liked in terms of curtains. And then here, the same thing, well, it's slightly different, with the sheer curtains and then just the decorative swag on top. Over here, we have the draperies, they come to the floor, the cornice, and then the curtains coming to the end of the windowsill. There was a time when that was very popular. Not so much today, but again, very popular in its time. We've gone over to what they're calling a multi-purpose room here. This is one side of the room. Here, let's go over here. And this larger area is the other side of the room. I would describe that as a family room. Uh, I think most people would today. But back in the day, the multi-purpose room was the living room where the family congregated, but it wasn't a place where you would entertain guests. The window treatments here, I'm not sure what's so significant about them or why this is in the window treatment section, but I don't know. This is what they decided to do. Interesting to note the colors in this room. Um, we have a sort of dark slate blue walls. Um, the blue is being picked up all across the room. Red and yellow for accent furnitures. We have an accent piece over here in yellow too. More blues and our red is being picked up. The last book we looked at, they didn't seem very interested in drawing the colors across the room. They would have all of the color. Remember the gold walls, and the gold sofa, and then the green rug and the green chair, and the colors weren't drawn back and forth. So the rooms just didn't look very integrated. Here, you can see, they are definitely trying to integrate the colors on this room. So now we're back into curtains, which is where we're supposed to be after that digression. Um, we have these uh, cafe curtains, basically, tier on tier. That was very popular in colonial America. We think of that as kitchen curtains or uh, the kind of curtains you might put in a child's room. Back in colonial America, you would have seen curtains like this in living rooms. Now, they wouldn't be in the grand living rooms at Monticello, for example, but the living rooms of well-to-do people 
not Jefferson. So this was something that was, well, it has the advantage of a lot of antiquity on its side. And it comes back to the fact that initially all a curtain was meant to do was cover a window. It would, uh, uh, curtains like this would block the view. Heavy draperies would cut out the draft and, of course, block the view, but they were heavy draperies. So when they were blocking the draft and blocking the view, they were also blocking all the incoming light. So curtains in this period served a purpose, and they didn't lose the intention of the curtains in the design. We have some examples of cornices here. A very simple one, these are still used today. A more elaborate scalloped cornice, again, still used today. Same thing here. And these are usually, not always, usually just a plywood shell, and then you would put batting over it, cover it with fabric, and it would match the draperies. Other times, you would take something, usually the straight ones, dress them up with molding, and leave them as wood and paint them. You wouldn't cover them with fabric, and you still do see a lot of those today, too. This one obviously has trim along the bottom, and again, that's common more decorative. This sort of thing is no longer common. Uh, this still is, this is not. And let's take a look at this. Remember, this is 1954. You can still go out to uh, drapery and decorator stores and get rods like this. The one with the balls on the end, very, very popular. So you can see, things like this haven't changed in 70 years. This one is interesting. This is a swag, and it's just made by drawing some fabric through a couple of rings on either end. I don't see that much anymore, but that was a thing we saw a lot in the 70s and 80s. And here we're looking at the way uh, a curtain is affixed to the rod. And this is what I was mentioning before, talking about pinch pleats. The way you make a pinch pleat drapery is you stitch in a piece of stiff fabric. It's called drapery tape because, in fact, it's all pre-measured for you. You fold your curtains, tack it, and then when you flip it over the underside, there's a little channel you can stick the drapery hook into. You can still buy pinch pleated drapery hooks and they're commonly used with traverse rods, the kind of rods where you pull the cord on the side to open and close the drapes. They were made specifically for the pinch pleated draperies because that little hook would just go in to a little circle on the traverse rod and they would all get pulled back by the cord. So these are how draperies were traditionally made. Well, now we're on a section about details. So I'm assuming that we're meant to look at accessories. Notice that lighting fixture. That lighting fixture, clearly this is a book from 1954. In the last maybe 10 or 15 years, this is the sort of thing that has emerged as the hot lighting fixture. So, wow, are we polishing our crystal ball. We have a very simple design here. We are getting very close to mid-century modern. In fact, I would have to say that I would not consider this dinette set to be out of place in a mid-century modern setting. Here, again, a lot of this is 
very close to what we would later identify as mid-century modern. Uh, the chair in particular. Uh, I like the the white draperies here. I, I have to say that it's it's a good contrast to the dark walls, but I'm not really crazy about that rod going across over the top of the picture. I'm not sure what they were trying to do there. Also notice we've got exposed beams too. Another thing that came back with a vengeance in the 80s. Now, this, well, here we've got our exposed beams again. This brick uh, breast for the fireplace, again, something that, that just reemerged some 30, 40 years later as a hot item. And again, note, these are pendant fixtures, so they're coming down from the ceiling. Very modern, you could see that in a modern kitchen. I have to say, I'm not crazy about this room. It gives me a very sort of Christmas vibe. That's one of the things I noticed in this book. Their hot color combination was red and green. Not nuts about that. Also, um, as you know from what I was saying before, from the 1968 decorating book, Green wall, green sofa, I think that's a mistake, but I guess to each his own. Fortunately, they have a, a sort of neutral beige carpeting here. From a practical standpoint, I would say that's a mistake. If it were me, I'd put the beige on the wall and the green on the floor, because that is going to show every spill and every footprint. But again, I'm more practical. We have another sort of oddball window treatment here. This appears to be some kind of Venetian blind. I'm really not sure. It looks like it's got ribbon and then occasionally uh, some slats painted out in a different color. Strange, but... Again, that's something we saw more of later when mini blinds were starting to become a thing and people started doing interesting things with them. So let's go down here. This is getting close to mid-century modern again, but not too close. There's, there are so many traditional elements in this, I would have to say they haven't crossed the line yet. I could see a sofa like this, although I think this may be a daybed based on the unusual depth of the piece. I could see something like that in a room today and not really be surprised. Okay, this is a great rug for an American country setting. I don't see that it goes well with the furniture design at all, because the furniture design is very formal, very, very high style, so to speak, and braided rugs like this are more country casual, but still, it's nice to see it. And something like this, um, I'm not sure if this is a parquet floor or a tile floor, but again, I like the fact that it's not that wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. This room definitely has a mid-century kind of feel to it. I would not expect to walk into a house and see that today. It tends to look a little dated. This is, um, well, they're calling it carousel tile. I'm assuming that is the 1954 version of vinyl tile. Interesting. I would not do that in my own home, thank you very much. But I like the fact that they were playing with the tile. Definitely something worth looking at. That particular type of playing, no. But I, I like the fact that they were doing this sort of experimenting. These are actually um, clay tiles. I would get dizzy if I had to spend much time in a room like that. But again, I like that they're playing with it. Uh, that was something that 
people were just beginning to do, to do a little weird sort of modern art experimenting with the way they were decorating their homes. So let's take a look at this. There is a lot I love about this room. Now, as I mentioned before, they, they have two go-to color combinations in this book, and they seem to be variations on a theme. The first was red and green, that Christmas combination, and the second is a muted version of the red and green, and it's sort of pink and gray. In this case, it's, it's a sort of salmon-y pink. I find a lot to love in this room. I really like the fact that the seating is picked up in the pictures. That's nice. I like that instead of putting the pink sofa against the pink wall, it's the gray sofa there for contrast. I love the hardwood floors. I'm a sucker for hardwood floors. It's restful. That's the thing that appeals to me about this. I never really got a comfortable vibe from mid-century furniture. You look at, this, for example, no arms. We've got no pillows on this. Uh, the furniture, here, take a look at how narrow those arms are. Uh, not the sort of thing you want to curl up in with a book. Nevertheless, it's restful. It's not busy. You don't have a million things competing for your attention, and I like it. This is the kind of room I could move in tomorrow and live with, you know, with a lot of pillows added, but still, um, as I say, the hardwood floors, oh, I love that. So, I have to say, there are some mid-century rooms I really like. This is one of them. Now, this room is all about the carpeting. I don't know what color it is, but we have a huge expanse of it. It's going right up the stairs, too. Um, the caption mentions that the, uh, the fact that the carpet goes up the stairs integrates the stairs into the rest of the room. This... This just looks like a giant empty space to me. And in many ways, I find this very typical of the older style of decorating. And by older, I mean we're going back to the 18th century when all the furniture had to hug the walls and the only thing you found in the center was the table where the ladies would bring up their chairs to do their embroidery. And you don't even have that here. It looks like this is a room with an open floor space because people wanted to practice their ballroom dancing or something. It just doesn't seem very practical to me. And even though there's plenty of furniture, to my eye, the room still looks very empty. And of course, if this carpeting is not in a nice color, ew, can you imagine? Uh, there's just, there's so much of it that an off-color would just be unfortunate. Here we have another room that you could walk into tomorrow. You could go over to your friend's house and see a room very similar to this. It's not jarring. It's a style and a layout that was popular 70 years ago and still reasonably popular today. Now let's scoot over here. Um, a room like this, and this is just a hallway. The architectural feature is the stairs. And this is done very traditionally. We're looking at antique or antique style furniture with the oriental style runner going down the middle of the hall. That's something that you could see today you could have seen the year I was born. You could have seen 200 years before I was born. So that's very classic. This is a bedroom very mid-century. Notice how squared off that bed looks, those sharp corners. That's something we got away from. And of course, the, the very squared off 
bookcase pieces uh, on the furniture. You look at a room like this and you can almost date it to the year because it's very, very mid-century. Something like this, we're still very mid-century, but there are a lot of facets of this room that would suggest to me it might be a little later, perhaps even 10 years later, going in to the early to mid-60s. Uh, and I find that very, very interesting. All right, and let's finish off with this. This is one of their instructional pages. This is picture hanging, the do's and don'ts. As you can see, this is a no. We have a nice little arrangement around a fireplace and a picture that looks like somebody stuck a postage stamp on the wall. The yes version is over here. Much larger piece, lower, closer to the top of the mantel. We still see that today. In fact, today you can walk into houses and the picture is resting on top of the mantel rather than being hung on the wall. So, still good advice today. Again, the, the sofa, everything is very low and the picture looks like somebody just stuck a stamp on the wall. Instead, they are suggesting an arrangement of pictures. And that's very nice, but of course you could also go with a very large piece. I find this a little more interesting than a very large piece, but still, you just want to avoid tiny picture over a large furniture group. In this case, the large comes from the length. This is a very long sofa, and it's elongated further by the fact that there's an end table extending it on the end, and the fact that it's low, which makes that length even more apparent with something tiny. Here, again, large, tiny. So that's what you want to avoid. In this case, now we've got the long, low sofa, and a lot. We are covering that space. This. Now, people do this all the time. I still see them do it today. This two pictures stagger. And you're probably asking yourself, why in the world are people still doing that? Well, they are doing it because it's easier than getting two pictures at the same height. Well, at least they think it is. So they'll stagger it because you get it in there and you don't have to worry about the spacing. When they show this assortment here, you can see how much better it looks. And I hope it's not just me. That definitely looks better. There are tricks you can use to do something like this. And hold on a second. I'm going to show you one of those tricks. All right. Let me back up a little so you can see the whole thing. These pictures are all hung at along the same line and at, well, these two are equal heights. Notice how I did it. You can very easily get these little uh, picture hanging loops. You just screw them into the top of the picture frame. You use a decorative hook. Let me see if I can get that on the side so you can see. It's not a standard picture hook. It's a decorative hook so that when you look at it, the actual picture hanging apparatus is all part of your display. It makes it super easy because all you're doing is grabbing a tape measure and making marks on the wall. That's all you have to do. And because your little picture hanging loops and your hooks are all going to be the same from one picture to another, I could take this picture off and switch it with that one. It's going to look the same. It, it really takes all the guesswork out of it. Striped wallpaper doesn't hurt either. That invariably keeps things in line. But I did want to show you that because there are 
tricks to deal with this. Okay, so on the way out, let's quickly take a look at a bit of mid-century lighting. As you can see, really moving into mid-century modern. And we will return to this book, because I don't know about you, but I'm having fun with it. So, meantime, go on over to the Sumi's Angels Facebook page, sign up for the giveaways, stick around for the fellowship. You won't be sorry. Meantime, we're going to take a look at a nice little springtime slideshow on our way out. I don't know about you, but I am ready for spring to be here. I will see you this evening for the Just Chattin' series, and again um, next week for thrifting videos. Have a terrific...